All right, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and another opportunity to share your word. Lord, I pray that you be here with the men that are uh, present here and those that uh, uh, weren't able to make it here uh, yet tonight or at all uh, that might be viewing this uh, teaching sometime in the future uh, on our YouTube channel. Lord, I just pray that each and every person uh, will receive something tonight uh, whenever they view this teaching, something that will be uh, pertinent to them, something that they can um, just dig into a little bit more in their own personal Bible study time. Lord, we uh, lift up the ladies as well as they're going through a, a study time in Psalms. Lord, I pray that you bless and encourage them and uh, again the men here. And Lord, just to be with us, continue to help us, Lord, to follow you in all our uh, activities in word and in deed. Lord, um, help us, Lord, to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone said? Amen. 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 All right. Uh, well, whenever most teachers get up here and start, they always kind of like to do some sort of um, overview, I guess, to kind of get them in a flow of motion, uh, I guess, and just kind of get the vocal cords loosened up. So uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a uh, Zachariah review. I'm not going to go back that far, obviously, but just little things that may or may not have been brought up in previous overviews or chapter teachings. Um, so, you've seen this several times from myself, and I know um, Steve has used it also, and uh, well, Steve and I might be the only ones that use PowerPoint uh, that I've recently used or seen. Um, so, you can see in green over on the far right, we have Zechariah, who we're focusing on tonight, but there's also mention in one of my overview topics here, Zechariah was one of the three prophets, along with Haggai and um, Malachi, uh, who ministered to the exiles as they returned from Jerusalem. So, they're shown there in green. We've, uh, we've already covered the books of Ezra and the book of uh, Nehemiah. You can see they're uh, not necessarily contemporary with Zechariah, but they came a little bit later. In one of the themes here in uh, Zechariah is of encouragement and hope is an underlying theme of the prophecies of Zechariah. A lot of his visions have already been touched on in previous chapters. Uh, also, I didn't know if it's already been brought up, but Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. Um, so that's a, a pretty cool name. And as people have brought up in times past, you know how a lot of in Hebrew culture a child's name was uh, very important to them. Sometimes it was indicative of maybe they thought the personality that child was going to, to be, uh, or there may just be other reasons why they came up with a, a very descriptive, well, a Hebrew word, at least in English, transliteration, to us really means something. I'm sure it means just as much to Zechariah. He knew that it meant also Yahweh remembers, but that was just a, a kind of a neat name that he was so closely associated or tied to the Lord. Zechariah was a member of the tribe of Levi and probably served as both prophet and priest. So that's a possibility. We definitely know he was a prophet. But being of the tribe of Levi, he may have taken on some other uh, responsibilities as well. Zechariah challenged the returning exiles to uh, turn to the Lord. Um, you know, they were struggling um, early on. Um, he came on the scene, so that was one of his main challenges was to encourage the exiles to, to turn more to the Lord than what they had been in the past. Zechariah condemned the oppression of the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the poor. So those were things that he, uh, those were the people groups that he really tried to uphold and bring attention to and allow, or not make, but have people focus more on and not forget about these individual people groups, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the poor. You can see here on the timeline, um, something about the temple. This, uh, construction began again on the temple in 520 BC, so five years prior to the temple completion. And Zechariah, from what best I could tell, his last dated prophecy uh, was about 518 BC, and then uh, three years later the temple actually finished being uh, completed uh, there in 515 BC. Uh, as a preacher of righteousness, he called God's people back to the virtues of justice, kindness, compassion, and truth. So those are some of the things about Zechariah. I'm sure there's many more that other people have brought up in, in previous teachings, but I'll just bring those to the forefront. 
as we jump into um, 12 verses in this book. So it's kind of a short chapter, so I doubt that I'll be wrapping up at 8 o'clock, probably a few minutes before that, um, but we'll see, uh, see how much uh, ad-libbing we end up doing. <laughs> so, verse 1, you can either follow along on your phone or paper Bible or up on the screen. Verse 1, ask the Lord for rain in the latter, in the, let me start over. ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. So the latter rain uh, we see here uh, refers to the rain that comes in what's called the late spring. And it's really essential for an abundant grain harvest. Obviously they want rain to happen uh, in the early spring. But they really prayed for it to come in the latter part of the spring. Right when the crops have already been sprouted and almost full grown. And I guess that... If you've ever spent time on a farm uh, and it's been dry for a little bit, and then they get you know a good downpour, things just really turn green and corn will sprout up six inches almost overnight, it seems. Things will really grow. And that's what they were really hoping for, for a lot of the, the wheat and grains that they were growing and whatever, just their gardens in general, and the pastures for their cows and so on. They just really enjoyed the, the latter rains before the heat of the summer would come, just to give that final oomph. Uh, for whatever crops they might be growing to, to, to flourish and really get an abundant crop, hopefully. hopefully. We can see this also spoken about in Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, verses 13 and 14. And it shall be that if you earnest, notice the if and then the then. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then... I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. Yeah, I forgot about the, the, the grapes for the, the vineyard for pressing it into the wine and then their olives um, for pressing into oil. Um, but I always like to point out whenever I come across, you know, in my Bible, whenever I come across it, I always underline or circle the if and then the then. Uh, you know, these are conditional statements that require action on our part when we're reading the scripture. And the Lord was saying, you know, in his word, if before you get the then, before you get the, the benefit of the spring rain, the latter rain, you have to do if you do this stuff first. If you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you to love the Lord your God and serve him, then you get the rains. So uh, there, there were many times we read about the scripture when they went through uh, series and periods of drought. Um, and Elijah stopped up the rain for three years. And then when he finally prayed, the, the rains did come. Um, but yes, the latter rains are very important. So no rain equals no crops equals no eating. Oops. And then no living. <laughs> you don't have food to eat. So yeah, praying for rain uh, is very important. And we see here in verse 1, it says, ask the Lord for rain. So asking the Lord, I mean, we would say, you know, that's praying to the Lord. Uh, for these rains to come. So it's important to recognize that God is the rain giver. So Zechariah was saying, pray to the Lord and ask for these rains. So why would he do that? Why would he say pray to the Lord? Well, in verse 2 we see, for the idols speak delusion. The diviner envisions lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They, they are in trouble because there is no shepherd. So idols, we see here, refers to household gods. And evidently, Zechariah was seeing too much evidence of people not praying to the Lord, but rather maybe following after their idols, diviners, um, instead of asking, seeking the Lord and more than things than what they were doing. So the diviners, uh, you may, it may remind you of someone else in Scripture that uh, has been covered before, Balaam. So diviners like Balaam interpreted omens as a means of foretelling the future, just in case you weren't familiar with that term, diviners. Also in the same passage, um, the metaphor of shepherd we see at the very end of this verse uh, was often used in the ancient Middle East to represent a, a king or a ruler. So 
So when shepherd is used, sometimes it's referring to the king or ruler. Other times, just specifically like a word shepherd, we think of, a, of a, usually a man that was herding the sheep and herding the goats. We can certainly call them a shepherd as well. But here the emphasis was on a lack of spiritual leadership when, there's, when, they, when it says here, because there is no shepherd, they had no spiritual leadership. That's what Zachariah was really pointing out. So when we submit to leaders, we are submitting to God. When we submit to leaders, we are submitting to God. I mean, again, you, you look at the news, you look at uh, TV, radio, podcasts, just, there's just so many instances of leaders <coughs> and bad leaders uh, out there. But as we read about in uh, many passages in Scripture, God, I believe, God has ordained every single person, good and evil, to be in whatever period of time they were for a reason. Um, otherwise, it, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, God knows everything that's going to happen, uh, and we just have to trust in Him to know that there's a reason for everything. Um, you say Hitler, yes, and all these Mussolini, and all these different dictators, and people that have ended up killing hundreds, of thousands, and even millions of people. Was there really a purpose to that? I'm not going to stand up here and say I know what the purpose of and reason for all of those were, but there definitely was. And maybe we'll have to wait until heaven someday to ask these tough questions. Man, what were you thinking when you did this or allowed this to happen? But yes, when we submit to leaders, we are submitting to God. And that's what Zechariah was wanting us to do, was to submit to good spiritual leaders, not to these um, diviners and idols that were telling us false dreams and were comforting in vain. So if the spiritual leader is following lies, the people tend to follow their leader just like the sheep as we see in this verse. So as the leader goes, so goes, by definition, a leader has followers. So uh, if a leader is going down the wrong path for one reason or another, typically there's going to be other people following that leader down that same path. Sometimes it has to get really bad before that leader is overthrown or that, or that leader is replaced with someone else. Um, I don't know, you can think about it in a political sense, Democrats and Republicans, whatever side you're on, you know, it, you, over time it just bounces back and forth, doesn't it, between uh, political powers. Um, and again, depending on which side you're on, you think some are good and some are evil. It's just all kind of a matter of perspective sometimes. Not always. So there's a little bit of a contrast between what we see in verse 1 and verse 2. Uh, in verse 1, we see that the, the source of natural blessings is from the Lord. Uh, verse 2, that not... So the difference between verse 1 and verse 2 is that uh, there's not a... I, my notes are kind of confusing myself now. Uh, basically, there's not idolatrous and deceptive false shepherds that that we should be following. We should not be following those. That's the contrast between verse 1 and verse 2. Uh, so we, verse 1, as I mentioned, you know, we should be following the Lord, asking the Lord in prayer for all things. So God is the source of all good gifts. But Judah turned to idols, they turned to diviners, and they turned to false shepherds, and to their fallen leaders, as we see here in this verse. So a question, what have you been turning to? What have you been turning to? Any idols that you need to get rid of? So, literally, just kind of think about this for a second. Um, social media. Have you been elevating that in your life to a possible level of being an idol? I mean, how many different social media accounts do you have? Can you count it on one hand or do you have to go to the second? Um, that you, if you have to go to the second, or even sometimes on one hand, that takes a lot of time to stay up and current with all these different levels of social media. Uh, maybe TV. I mean, it, back in the day, um, it seemed like a lot of people were really addicted to TV and spending, even the studies nowadays, I've heard one recently, that's probably four months ago, but it seems like there's still like an average of four hours a day by the uh, American adult. That's, still, that's how much TV they still watch a day. So four hours is, is a lot. Then add on social media. Uh, is work an idol? In your life. Some people have really elevated uh, work in their life and just to spend nearly every waking hour there. Um, how about exercise? Um, you, you can take it to an extreme. Um, you know, for instance, some 
types of exercise like biking. If you like to do long distance biking, there's nothing wrong with that. But just to do long distance biking, uh, like 100 miles in a day, that takes seven or eight hours, and then you got the recruit time after that. So that, you're almost kind of using a whole day. Because um, there's a guy I listen to on a podcast, and he used to do long distance biking. Uh, and he has a wife, and he had two kids at the time. And he just realized that this, he really, he called, this is his words, he called it an idol in his life. He just didn't recognize it then, because this was 15 years ago. Now he's looking back on it and saying, wow, that was kind of an idol in my life, because we weren't really spiritually following the Lord as we should. I was taking, working 80 hours a week at my two jobs, and then on the weekends, I would say bye to the family as I go ride my bike for 100 miles on Saturday, and then I'd be wasted, you know, worn out on Sunday, just trying to recuperate from that 100 mile bike ride. So he, and then Monday, he'd just go back to his work, and then he was kind of, kind of neglecting his family. Uh, again, so that was something that he elevated to the point of an idol uh, in his life. So it may not be exercise or biking for you, it could be something else, you know, one of these other things, or even something else that I didn't list. So again, back to my question, any idols you need to get rid of? We know idols, anything above, that we put in front of worshiping our Lord could be considered an idol. So just think about that, maybe that's your takeaway for tonight is to maybe evaluate how much your time is spending doing fill in the blank. Verse three, my anger is kindled against the shepherds and I will punish the good herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. While Israel lacked national leadership, there were plenty of tyrants seeking to rule God's people. These goat herds will be judged. Um, the goats, or these goats, are those that have not turned towards the Lord. Uh, there's a few passages in Scripture where we talk about um, you know, the sheep and the goats. Uh, so the one that's probably most familiar to a lot of us that we've either heard uh, quoted on screen or just in writing or just as you're reading the word, the word is in Matthew 25. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So God we're going to see here is going to strengthen the house of Judah as an instrument to overthrow uh, the oppressors. Verse 4. From him comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. So several translations, or I guess I should say a few translations that I happen to look at, uh, don't say from him, which is what we see in the New King James Version, but in the several, a couple other translations, it may say, out of Judah. I think the King James is one that says, out of Judah, the comes, the cornerstone. And out of Judah, the tent peg. Out of Judah, the battle bow. No, the um, Judah says, out of him. Okay. King James says, out of him. Out of him? Yes. Okay. King James says, out of him. Okay, so out of Judah, all right? Maybe it was the NIV, and maybe the New American Standard, but I remember looking at 10 different versions or so they had uh, out of Judah. So that, so a slight variation, possibly a slightly different meaning, uh, the way you read out of Judah versus from him, or out of, what do you say is out of, out of him, instead of out of Judah. Okay. So what are these main things that are being brought to our attention here? The cornerstone. The cornerstone is an image of steadfast strength or stability, coupled with possibly beauty, beauty and honor. Uh, a cornerstone is strong also. It joins two walls together. So, uh, you know, you might think of a cornerstone in, in the base of a pyramid, or the cornerstone somehow in a, in a stone house. Um, a cornerstone was just something that was put in place and kind of helped direct the angle of the two walls that are being joined or formed together. So the cornerstone was often a very important piece to have perfectly in place. And a tent peg is stable when it's firmly in place, and it suggests permanence and endurance. And then Zechariah also brings attention to the battle bow. Uh, it is usually used uh, in battle, and 
a good bow would be considered a battle bow when it's uh, been used in victory. It pictures the strength necessary for military conquest. And so in contrast, I guess, to a battle bow, I found a, a verse um, in Psalm 78 that talks about a deceitful bow. It says, Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God, and did not keep His testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked Him to anger with their high places and moved Him to jealousy with their carved images. So basically, a, any small flaw in your instrument of war, in this case, a bow, an arrow, something that you pull back, a small flaw in it would cause it to be a deceitful bow. You may not notice a crack in the wood or something, or uh, I'm not an expert, in, I've never even, well, I pulled back a bow and shot an arrow, but never hit the target, so I don't know a whole lot about it. But back in the day, I'm sure all these were made out of wood, and then eventually we might have been able to make some out of uh, some metallurgical metal that was a little bit more flexible. I know nowadays they got compound bows and stuff that are made out of fire glass and reinforced carbon steel, I'm sure, and all this uh, really strong stuff. But back in the day, if you had a, a bow that was just constantly defective, that you, you wouldn't want to take it to, to battle. You, you probably always took your best bow and arrows to battle with you. That, that was what you called your battle bow, um, rather than your deceitful bow. And that wasn't always as trustworthy as the bow you wanted to use in battle. And then finally, that fourth thing that was mentioned in verse 4 was the ruler. So every trustworthy and sovereign ruler would come out of Judah. So we got some strong things coming out of him or out of Judah. The cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, and the rulers. Verse 5. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies and admire the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. Who, are the, who is this they? Just in case you didn't pick up on from verse 4. From him comes the cornerstone. Um, it's actually back here. The, the, the sheep. He's referring to the, the sheep of in Judah. He's actually going to turn these sheep into battle-ready warriors. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because of the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. So sheep are the last animal you probably want to take to war with you. But we see here that they're going to become God's attack sheep. They become mighty men and tread down their enemies eventually. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. It shall be as though I have not cast them aside, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. The house of Judah indicates Israel's southern territory. So we see the house of Judah and the house of Joseph uh, being mentioned here. So Judah was the, the Israel's southern territory, you know, the divided kingdom that we often speak about, especially uh, back in the early Old Testament books of 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Um, basically after Solomon, King David, and then Solomon, and then we ended up with the divided kingdom. Uh, Judah in the south, and sometimes called Israel in, in the north. Um, but what Zechariah is referring to as the house of Joseph was um, in Israel's northern territory, Dominated by the two other tribes called Ephraim and Manasseh, which were the two tribes named after Joseph's sons. So Ephraim and Manasseh basically dominated, were the strongest tribes there in the, the northern part of Israel. So Zechariah is now bringing a very positive message um, to the people he's speaking to in Jerusalem uh, after some of them, some pretty serious visions uh, he had given earlier uh, in this book previous chapters that we've already covered. Verse 7, Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I, I didn't have much to say uh, about this verse, except that uh, I believe, uh, at least in the commentary that I was looking at, 
That wine is used here as a symbol of abundant joy. And their heart shall be rejoiced as if with wine. So as if with great joy. Uh, I guess the, the commonality there is typically you drink a little bit of wine, typically you get a little tipsy, and maybe you just feel a lot more joyful. So that was the, the, the connection there between wine and abundant joy that he's trying to, to get at there. I will whistle for them and gather them, for I will redeem them, and they shall increase as they once increased. So as a shepherd signals his sheep, so the Lord will whistle for his people. You see the word whistle here. Uh, in other contexts, again in other versions, uh, your, whatever you might be reading from, instead of a whistle, uh, the shepherds often used a, a, a reed pipe. So some versions actually use the, the word pipings. Uh, and there's other, another passage in Scripture that I didn't capture here that actually talked about the shepherd piping to his sheep. Um, and then there's also another version that, uh, I know this one was in the King James, it used the word hiss. So, you know, he kind of make that hissing sound. That's exactly a possible sound that the shepherds would use instead of a, a pipe or whistling. So imagine um, these shepherds are out in their, their pastures in the prairie. And it's uh, uh, probably in the evening where it's time to gather them all back to their centralized location, but they first stop off at a watering hole. Um, so maybe there's two or three shepherds that happen to get to this watering hole at the same time, each shepherd with their own 10, 12, 15 sheep, and maybe some goats mixed in around this watering hole. So now we've got 30, 40 sheep and goats all intertangled here. But then there comes a time when each shepherd says, well, see you later, Joe. See you later, Bob. I got to go back home. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow at the same time, same place type thing. And that one shepherd, as he was about ready to leave, he would whistle or he would pipe or he would hiss. And his 10 or 11 sheep would leave and start to follow him because his sheep knew his voice, knew, his, knew the sound that their shepherd that they follow made. Uh, and, and this is a real thing. Um, I was listening to Pastor Joe Foch, um, and he was sharing with, when he was on one of these Israel trips, um, they were on the outskirts of town, and there was an actual shepherd coming down a hillside. I think he said seven sheep behind him. And he asked him this question, because he just happened to see, and it was just visual imagery from the Bible. He saw it right there in real life. And he actually motion to the shepherd to come over to see if he could talk to him and his group uh, for a little bit. And he said, the shepherd said, yes, these seven sheep, I know by name. This is Ethel, this is Gertrude, whatever the names were. Mm -hmm. you know, he named them all off and he said, this one, she likes, um, you have to be abrupt with this one. You have to speak sternly to her, otherwise she just won't listen to you. And this one over here, you gotta sometimes throw a stick at him to get him to keep up with the pack. But they all had personality. Um, and they all knew that when he went somewhere, they followed him. And it was just, he was very descriptive of every sheep. And Joe was just like amazed that he knew so much about each one of these sheep. It wasn't, I mean, they almost all look alike. I'm sure there must have been some distinction, a patch of something or a, a bald spot or something about them that he could really tell them apart. But they had a personality. Uh, and they knew his voice. I mean, they stopped while Joe was talking to him, and then he said when they were done talking, the shepherd took off. He, he, he didn't say if he whistled, piped, or hissed at his sheep, but they, I think he just started walking, and they started following him, um, single file, and then boom, they, he left, they left. So, I mean, this is a real thing. I mean, that God wouldn't put it in scripture, I'm sure, if it, it wasn't true. So I'm sure you probably find a shepherd in Israel today, and you would see this type of action taking place. So a sheep knew his voice. So we're talking about things happening for a reason. And in 1948, uh, some of you may remember the exact date that Israel became a nation again. May 14th, uh, 1948, Israel became a nation again after roughly 2,000 years. You know, heard Pastor David talk about this before from the stage. This has never happened before history. So this was miraculous. Um, so back then and even before then, by a few years, you can imagine, or 
Again, Joe was talking about how God whistled and the Jews around the world began to physically come back to their homeland. And in the same con context, the same teaching I was listening to, Joe was saying that he was on the airplane ride, leaving Pennsylvania, getting ready to go to Israel on one of these tours again. And uh, he, he got, you know, they got housed, uh, like three on one side and two in the middle and three on the other side type thing, whatever it was. He was on an aisle, and then there was this family, husband, wife, and daughter, uh, in the other three seats right across the aisle from him. And he, like a pastor that wanted to just share the gospel when the opportunity arose, he just started talking first. And um, turns out, this was the final leg of the flight, actually. So I don't know if it was in Philadelphia or if, he, if they were on a flight in JFK or wherever it was. The final leg was going to take him into to Israel. So these were the people that were going to Israel just like he was. And he started talking to his husband and wife, and they were on the plane because three weeks prior to them getting on the plane, the husband was at, was at his workplace, and he just heard this still small voice said, "Go back home." He was a Jew. I didn't mention that. So he was Jewish, but he had come as a kid back to the United States and grew up in the United States with his mom and dad. He was a, an IT professional uh, and from San Francisco, the Silicon Valley somehow got on the same plane that Joe was, probably on JFK, to fly to Israel. But he had, for three weeks prior to this, had been that still small voice saying, you got to go back home, you got to go back home. And then the husband shared, you know, he was uh, talking to his wife one day, after two weeks of hearing this voice in his head, he says uh, to his spouse, you know, please have a seat, i got something i got to share with you. Before he even could even get it out of his mouth. The wife said, I know, we're going back to Israel. I knew this two weeks ago. Why did it take so long for you to tell him? <laughs> so she had heard the same, the same small know. voice. <laughs> and it, it took him two weeks to get around to telling her uh, he needed to be sure, I guess. Um, so they, and in a matter of three weeks, they packed up everything. They were moving there for good. He was leaving his job. He was financially well off enough. They were just going back to Israel. So this was, you know, the God whistling, hissing to this family to move back to Israel. He didn't say how many years ago this was, but I think the teaching I was listening to was probably from 12 or 15 years ago, the last time it was recorded. So it's just amazing. Uh, we need to pay attention to that still, small voice. Um, uh, God may be speaking to us. Some awesome stories. I'm sure they're out there. And, uh, it's cool that I got to have to listen to those that Joe shared. Verse 9, I will sow them among the peoples, and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children, and they shall return. So this is where I could have inserted that same story right here. Because uh, this is where he's talking about, they shall remember me in far countries. So this husband and wife, they heard about God, that still small voice was speaking to them while they were in Silicon Valley, California. Uh, together with their children, and they shall return exactly what that family did. But being sown among the peoples was God's punishment uh, for the exiles, for the disobedience. So, you know, you know, early on, back in... Uh, did I show that picture yet? No, I didn't show a picture yet. It's coming up. Um, you know, when, uh, when the, the, one of the conquests of the Northern Kingdom and then the People from Judah and Israel, well, northern Israel, northern Israel got taken away first to go to Assyria. Um, they, they were scattered among the peoples. That was one of the things that the um, Assyrians did, was they just relocated people groups and spread them amongst other people groups. Um, so that's kind of what it's saying here, and that's why I said being sown among the peoples was God's punishment of the exiles for their disobedience. That's why they were captured and, and led away way back in 722, and then finally in 586 when that third conquest of Jerusalem took place, and they all ended up, almost everyone ended up going to Babylon by then. So the words they, they shall remember, we see here in this verse, anticipate their turning to the Lord in repentance. So Zechariah is prophesying here, you know, that, and they shall remember me in far countries. And then the short phrase, shall live, they shall live implies more than mere survival. 
God promises spiritual life and blessing to all those that do repent. So they shall remember me in far countries. And the, I mean, there's stories that I know Pastor David, I know Pastor Nick and Kevin have also shared stories of, and Pastor D.A., of all the different instances of people coming from Egypt, from every country you can think of, Russian Jews, Romanian Jews, just the, dis, what's the word, diaspora? Diaspora. Diaspora. Um, happened so many years ago where Jews just got, they were just so afraid to stay where they're at. They just went out into many different countries, some forcibly to other countries, and then others just moved away from Israel uh, over the last 2,000 years, and then they just all finally, are, some of them are starting to return. So that's what they, they shall remember me, and they shall return with their children and their families. Verse 10. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. So this is the picture I was um, waiting for. In the very far left hand corner it says, Exiles taken from Israel to Assyria in 722 is the red dotted line. Um, <clears throat> so in the lower left hand corner again, almost in the center, you can see Israel and Judah. Um, so that's kind of where they're starting from, and then follow the dotted red line up to Nineveh, Assyria, and then some end up going over to the Far East, there to Ektana. Also notice uh, the, the rivers there, the blue lines, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, that's the area, the, the area of what we call ancient Mesopotamia, uh, where those kind of where those rivers converge. So that whole area, that swath of land between the rivers, is, uh, you know, from your ancient history books, we call that area the uh, northern Mesopotamia. So uh, God said in the verse that we just read, you know, He's going to bring people back from Egypt. So in the way down here in the far left hand corner, this is Memphis and Egypt and uh, Tafanes. Um, so Egypt and Israel have been lands where Israel was captive at one point or another. And Gilead is a territory east of the Jordan and southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you can see the Dead Sea, I think it is that long sliver that's not shaped like the Sea of Galilee. So I think the Sea of Galilee is further north up by, mm -hmm. which I mentioned the Jordan River there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's the area of Gilead. Um, I didn't get a really blown up map uh, of this area where you can see it a little bit better. Uh, and then Lebanon, which was mentioned in this verse, is a region north of Galilee, so hugging the, the coastal area there. Um, I believe just north of Tyre uh, would be the land of um, Lebanon. And, so, and then the future restoration will be so complete that the land will be filled with people. So as you know, presently, Israel is just a, a narrow, very small portion of land uh, hugging the Mediterranean Sea. It's nowhere near, I mean, I think when you read some of the older descriptions of the boundaries that Israel was supposed to have, um, it, it, it encompasses not quite this much, but it, it covered a big area uh, over here that Israel was really supposed to have early on. And over the course of millennia, uh, through battles and stuff, we, they've lost a lot of land. Is it, I don't know if it's still true or not, but I remember there, at one point in time there was the narrowest point of Israel maybe only nine miles wide. It seemed like they were indefensible in that area because if a plane or a missile or something, well, we know they're not indefensible because they've got, I don't know what they call it, but like Skynet or something where they, they're pretty darn good at shooting down incoming anything. Uh, nothing is going to get into Israel if they don't want it to. Um, but yeah, it's a very narrow country in, the, in certain areas of it. Much, much smaller than what it was intended to be and probably much, much smaller than what it will be. When, like it says here, when God wants everybody to start returning back, uh, I don't know if that's going to be more towards the, the, the end days, the last days, uh, but we'll see. And then finally, in verse 11, He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up. Then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. 
So God would remove any impediment to Israel's return. Here we see, um, at least what I see here is that Zechariah used imagery from the Exodus. For instance, the sea and the river to illustrate the kinds of obstacles God would allow the Israelites to overcome. The sea and the river. And finally, in verse 12, So I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in His name, says the Lord. The regathering will be accomplished by God's power as He gives strength to His people. As He gives strength to His people. So a question. When does the Lord bring you His much-needed strength? When does the Lord bring you His much-needed strength? Is it kind of in the midst of you going through a trial that He gives you strength? It's probably not before you enter that trial. Most likely it's not after you come through a trial. So sometimes it's in the midst of a trial. But maybe what sometimes usually has to happen before you finally recognize the strength that you've been giving to get through the trial. Is it after prayer? Is it through much needed prayer that finally you get that extra burst of strength or whatever it might take to get you through, fill in the blank, whatever that trial might be? Or maybe it's something else that comes to your mind. When does the Lord give you His much needed strength? Maybe it's not in the midst of a trial. Maybe it's just strength to get through each day. Uh, maybe it's strength to overcome a physical liability. Uh, maybe it's the strength to uh, do whatever your work is. So physical strength or just the emotional strength to get through uh, what you have to do at your workplace. So when does the Lord bring you His much needed strength? Each and every one of us, I'm sure it's at a different time. The life lesson is just a short one. God is a God of restoration. I think we see that a lot in this chapter. God is a God of restoration. God has replenished and restored His people to the land. Israel right now is replenished with many returning Jews. God can do a restoring work in your life as well. Just like verse 1 of this chapter started off with asking the Lord for the, the rain, the latter rain, we can ask the Lord for help. We can ask the Lord for mercy. We can ask the Lord for grace and for love. And we can ask the Lord for restoration. He is in that type of business, so, so call out to Him and He will answer. Uh, we don't know necessarily how or when He'll respond, but we do know is that He hears. Uh, you know, that as the saying goes, we don't know necessarily how He's going to answer it, but we know He's going to answer every single prayer that is lifted up. It's just maybe a yes, a no, or you're not ready yet. Something along those lines is, uh, He's going to answer every prayer, we just don't know how, but He does hear every request. So I would say, be more like a sheep, not a goat, and listen for his whistle, or that hiss, or that piping sound. He may be calling you now. Listen for his voice, that still, small voice. Um, that, it, it, for me, I, I, I've, I've heard that still, small voice, not the Lord's voice in my head, but it's just like an answer that comes to something when I wasn't even thinking about it. Um, so, so that to me, when I, in, in hindsight, I always look back and after I got a resolution to something, I said, wow, when, when that answer came, I wasn't even thinking about the problem. But the answer came. And it's, it's that still, small voice. And it, it was even in the devotional that I was reading this morning. Um, the Spurgeon morning and evening uh, devotional. And it was just... He was talking about how the still small voice is something that maybe as we get further along in our walk, um, or for whatever reason we're, we're hardened a little bit, or we've just been doing the same old, same old, day after day, month after month. For whatever reason, if we get hardened just a little bit, and we're not as receptive to that still small voice, we're, we're just not going to hear it as much anymore. Um, and there's examples of people that I know hear this still small voice much better than I do because I've heard of them. I, I, you, 
can almost tell sometimes when you hear people pray or when you hear them share their stories. Um, you know, when we're in here on the, the tote, the time of the encouragement on Sunday mornings, when Pastor Harry shares, he's got so many stories about God, you know, Pastor Lee would call him what? Gomans. God moments. Oh. Um, so I thought that was a pretty cool phrase. I don't know if he coined it or not. It was a pretty cool phrase. But Pastor Harry's got many of those too. So I, I know he's hearing from the Lord. He's tuned in. He, he, he uprooted his family and he moved to Winston. And that was a huge thing to do. Um, and, and there's so many other stories that's happened since then that he shared in here in, the, in those times of encouragement. So that's just one example that I know of um, of someone that's, that's tuned in to that, that still small voice. So I aspire to be more tuned in uh, each day that goes by. And that devotion, devotional this morning reminded me of it. And then you know, I put it in my notes too here. Is you know to, to listen to that still small voice. Why? Because he may be calling you. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you again for this time together. And as we bring this chapter to a close, Lord, we, we know that you're not done with us. Lord, you're still more sanctification that's going to be happening in each and every one of our lives. Uh, Lord, and I just pray that you would continue to help our hearts and our minds be open to your direction, to your leading. Help us, Lord, to, to not have a calloused heart or mind when it comes to spiritual things, or anything for that matter. But Lord, help us to be more receptive than ever before to your still small voice as you speak to us. Lord, we know you hear us when we pray. So, Lord, we know you're trying to speak back. So help us, Lord, to uh, be more in a dialogue with you rather than a monologue. So, Lord, help us to be receptive. And then, you know, in the right time, in the appropriate place, and maybe even share uh, what, you've, uh, what you've given us. Because a lot of times what you give us is not just for us, but it's for us to share with someone else. So, again, thank you for our time together. And bless each and every person here, Lord, as they... As they leave and go home, give us all safety on the roads and bless our time uh, in future um, coming together, whether it be Thursday or Sunday or just whenever it is when we see each other again, Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.